So, who are you? What's the first thing that you think of when you hear this question? What comes to mind? So, you go online, you post information, status update, check in somewhere, post a picture, post a video. This is creating digital data. And while you're doing that, data is being created about you and your activity. What you buy, where you look, when you go online, this information. This information is digital data, it's information about your personal thought and being. And this information acts like a currency that you can use to pay for services on the internet. So it's the business model of companies like Facebook and Google to provide services in exchange for this digital data. And not only is it digital data that they're taking, but they're, they're taking data control. So you, uh, you use these services and you forfeit data control to these companies. When organizations have data control of, of many different people, many different data sources, they have the ability to manipulate that data in many different ways. One of the ways in which data can be manipulated is selective censorship. And this can be a bad thing, and this can actually be a good thing. One of the ways that we censor things currently in this country is with explicit content. Um, content that is posted for the purposes of revenge, for the purposes of exploitation, is often filtered and censored by organizations who have data control. One of the other ways um, that we use in this country very commonly is copyright infringement. Uh, so last December, YouTube uh, created a new policy and an automated system for, for enforcing copyright infringement, and it ended up automatically taking down a lot of videos. Now, there are people whose living is made by posting these videos and, and curating YouTube channels. So when these automated copyright infringement systems go into effect, that can actually have a real impact on people's income and what's going on in their lives. Um, so that can be an issue, especially if YouTube doesn't want to pay anyone. In the news right now is Facebook, um, who's uh, updated their, their latest version of the voter megaphone, which uh, reminds people to vote. But the question is how much control does Facebook have over this data that they're providing, uh, that they're utilizing to use this system? Because Facebook could, if they wanted to, um, select just the voters they think will vote in the right ways at the right location, using only information that they have available to them, to steer an election in a particular direction. So this leads us to the um, problems with giving up data control, and that's that selective censorship and power over data control can lead to data control abuse. But what is the uh, real threat of this? Well, my personal background comes from the defense industry, and so I like to take a strategic approach to this. So let's invade a country. This grid on, on this display, <laughs> this is a, you know, a small, very square country. Uh, we have a little population, blue population centers there. So let's say I know nothing about this country at all. How do I invade it? Well, I have to, in order to acquire control, place my little red army dudes pretty much everywhere uniformly. That's a lot of force to maintain control of that, that country, and it's not very efficient. So if I had even the, the most limited amount of data, um, just where population is, I could cut that force down significantly just by putting force where the population is. But instead of uh, just doing that where where the population is, what if I have information on people who are gun owners? Maybe I only need to apply my army where people can fight back. Or social influencers, people who, uh, who steer the conversation of the culture and the society, or maybe the economic drivers. The conclusion is that data is the primary enabler of oppression. It is the number one thing that allows me to put the right force at the right location to maintain or acquire control. And so when we're forfeiting data control to organizations, giving them control and the ability to abuse that control, there is a serious threat to our society that can occur because of that. So who are you? How do you express yourself? Well, in, in our physical world, our social world, we can express ourselves by the things we say, the things we wear, how we modify our bodies, the things we decide to show or cover up, um, the way we smell, how, um, you know, punctual we are. There's many different ways that you have authority to express yourself. In, in digital reality, we're much more limited. In fact, uh, I would say that digital self-expression is in most cases 
dictated to users. Some of this is technology means. Uh, text messaging, for example, is limited from when it was designed in, in um, you know, terms of the number of characters that you can put in a text message. But in most cases today, self-expression is dictated by the policies of the digital services you use to communicate and collaborate with your peers, your friends, your loved ones, and strangers. These policies, um, often corporations are controlling these, are set by individuals that are not participating in the social movement, society, culture, or organization that, that you're using to express yourself. Not only can data control abuse influence your ability to express yourself, but there are other forms of technology that make it even worse. <coughs> One of them is digital surveillance. Digital surveillance implicitly limits self-expression because when you're being watched, you're not being yourself. And if you have any doubts about that, you can ask your children or your dog, maybe even sometimes your cat while you're gone, what they have to do. <laughs> so digital surveillance changes the knowledge pool and draws people toward a particular status quo and towards a particular way of expressing themselves, including possibly shunning people who are outside. So it limits not only what you have to say and how you can say it, but maybe who you collaborate with. Let me give you this, this premise. The problem with digital surveillance is not about privacy, it's about self-expression. Privacy is incredibly important. Um, I believe that it's right, I believe that it's really useful, but it's something that you really absolutely know how amazingly useful it is after you've already lost it. It's hard to kind of know in that in-between area when you really do and don't have privacy. And I think it makes it a difficult argument to combat digital surveillance uh, when, when it's so hard to establish what privacy is. But self-expression is something that we don't really want to give up. We know that that's self-identifying information, um, that it's our ability to be ourselves, who we are. Um, that's something that should not have a cost. Let me give you three axioms. The first is that technology enables more for less. And the mere fact that so many people can access this conversation is proof of that. It's been the entire drive of industrialization, and um, it's, it's readily apparent in today's world where we have remote command and control over our homes, uh, our Teslas, or possibly even our dog. Um, technology enables more for, for less. Second axiom is that our digital life, our digital society, extends our social life. Now, digital life, the internet, the technology we use, these things aren't just a second life that we participate in. They overflow with new forms of expression to enhance, augment, and expand our real personal lives in ways that we interact with different people. Um, ways that we understand ourselves, and ways that we influence and are affected by our world. It's an extension of real life. It's not a separate and independent existence. And the third axiom is that society is based on trust. I actually believe that's the definition of society. Society is the trust relationships between individuals. Going back to the earliest forms of society, moving into agricultural communities for the first time, people had to trust that at the end of uh, the season, that they would have food at harvest, food that could be uh, distributed in some way that, that is equal, some way that, that they could survive together by trusting people who aren't necessarily their blood. And continue that forward to today with modern societies where some of the most important trust relationships are forged between government and the governed. Government must trust that citizens are gonna behave in certain ways, that whole will of the government thing, and citizens have to trust that government will be able to apply laws and enforce those laws um, in ways that, that make sense and are reasonable in maintaining law and order and peace. Society is built on trust. So what is the social impact then of digital surveillance? Well, because technology enables more for less, digital surveillance is easy to apply universally. And we've seen this over the past year, thanks to some of the leaks by Edward Snowden and other events going on um, related to digital surveillance. Secondly, because digital life extends our, our social lives, this surveillance isn't just surveillance of digital personas or avatars. They're 
surveillance of our core identity, people's personal thoughts and being. And this is where we start to get into trouble because there's no trust required to operate an automated, digital, universally applied surveillance system. Let's think about social structures that don't require trust. What comes to mind for me is prison. Prisoners do not need to be trusted to be placed into cells and maintain control over it. Um, rehabilitation centers, mental health wards, uh, forced retirement centers. Slavery at one time was a tolerated institution that does not require trust of the individual's own. Um, I would also add high school to that list of similar <laughs> <laughs> What do all of these things have in common? They lack freedom of the individual's involved. When you apply universal digital surveillance technologies to a society in a way that maintains or achieves data control, and the ability to abuse that data control, you fracture the fundamental foundation on which society is built. That organization, that structure of people that are being controlled in a way that does not require trust can no longer be considered a society by definition. And because digital life extends social life, even when the surveillance and control is maintained just in the digital realm, it filters out through all of our social physical existence to become censorship and control of expression and thought. And because technology enables more for less, this great power is available to a very few select people. This power can be accessible to um, non-elected government organizations. It can be available to foreign governments, who might have a, an interest in influencing what goes on within a country. It could be accessible to terrorists, to hackers, to corporations that we know, love, and trust, and to children having too much fun and learning how to engineer computers. The abuse of digital data, digital surveillance, and other tools for data control abuse can enable virtually every type crime, dehumanization, and oppression known to man. These are some of the greatest tools for oppression that have ever been conceived. And it is because of this that I would posit that data control abuse will become the single most important social justice issue for the next 100 years, enabling every form of terrible things in the physical and in digital realities to coerce, manipulate, and control people. It's an enabler. It's a, a potential social justice knife. So my final question to you is who are you going to be? Will you stand for the innocent, the victims, the widows, the orphans, the oppressed, the people who will be most vulnerable? Will you support those who are losing their livelihood and their capability to express themselves. Because I think you can. I think you can make a difference in what is going on today. Some digital data control abuse is already occurring, especially internationally. The first thing I think you should do is take a look at who owns and who controls your data. Look at your footprint online and research where does this information go and who is pulling the strings on this. The information that I see and get online, is this information even true? Is it accessible to everyone? Or are there different knowledge pools developing in different product ecosystems, different nationalities, different cultures, different levels of interest? The second thing, there need to be some changes. We need new technology that enables better security. We need technology that can observe data control abuse when it's happening, identify those uh, perpetrating it, and, and be able to identify why they're doing it. And we also need social and political movements that support and defend people who can be victimized, oppressed, and manipulated through digital means. We need um, regulations that make sense. We need laws that make sense regarding corporate control of, uh, of digital data. Um, regarding how digital data can be utilized by third parties uh, who may have terrible intentions. Um, 
terrorists or hackers, for example. We need to be thinking about how we can build a future that makes sense for our children whose data may have never been controlled by them. Who has the authority over their data? Teach your children to learn and maintain control of your data. Identify not only who has control of your data, but whose data do you currently control, and how do you use that control? I can't tell you who you are, but I can tell you this. Who you are is so much more than just your data. So much more, and you can make a difference.